Hi guys, I hope you are doing great today. If you're new here, welcome, and if you're not, welcome back to the Everything Team podcast. In this episode, I interviewed Dave, who is a professional saxophone player and a business consultant. We talked about tips for growing a small business, his process of writing a piece of music, and so much more. The fact of the week is that the oldest known living land animal is a tortoise. Is a toy tor toys tor <laughs> tor turtle tortoise tortoise tortoise. There we go. So it is a tortoise named Jonathan, who is 190 years old. He was born in 1832 and has lived on the island of St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean since 1882. Also, we reached a thousand downloads last week, so thank you so much for listening, and hopefully this podcast will continue to grow. Also, I am going to have a free giveaway giveaway soon, meaning that anyone who signs up for it will receive it. It's a digital tool that I made that I think a lot of podcasters will enjoy. So if you're interested, make sure to follow me on Instagram at the everything.team podcast. Without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. Hi, Dave. How are you doing today? I'm good. I was just going to say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of the everything team podcast. I've awesome. heard a few episodes and I've, I've uh, learned some things. So Great, Great to be here and um, today I want to talk uh, to you about your career as a musician and as well as the consulting you do also on the side. So first let's talk about kind of um, your musician. So what's your experience in the field and so far as a musician? And can you talk to us a bit about that? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I've been playing, I've been playing the saxophone in music since I was about 12 years old. And um, as, a, as a professional, I've, I've done everything from pop and rock bands, blues bands, jazz bands, played weddings. Uh, and then I've become an original jazz composer, you know, where I've written a lot of compositions, uh, had my led my own bands and gotten gotten them. some of my songs recorded and, and put out uh, four albums of my own material and play occasionally in um, New York City clubs and in other cities around North America. That's great. And um, what led you into pursuing mainly the saxophone? You know, when I was 12 years old, I went to a showcase where the, the local music store had out these instruments and mm-hmm. they would rent them out to your parents for three or six months because, of course, a lot of people quit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was a short term thing. You didn't have to buy the instrument. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I was comparing between the saxophone and the trombone. And in the end, I just decided that the saxophone looked cooler. And when I watched <laughs> uh, television shows, like the music from the saxophone was more appealing to me. So I chose the sax and don't regret it. Great. And um, can you talk to us a bit about your education and kind of your experience in school playing the saxophone or just um, playing different kinds of um, instruments? Sure, sure. So... I did learn in school and I learned through school bands and my first teacher was band director of this of the school band. I uh, I think one of the things that was helpful to me is I was always interested in music that wasn't just being played by the, the school band. Mm-hmm. So I would hear songs on the radio and I would try to play them by ear or I would hear sounds in my own head and I would try to play them on the instrument. And so that way, when I finished with school, you know, and I was never a music major. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't get a degree in music. It wasn't my main course of study. But when I finished school, there was music that I could play. And I didn't have to be like like many people who finish school. And if the school isn't organizing a band, yeah. there's nothing left to do. And you just, the instrument stays in the closet. Mm-hmm. And then in 10 years, you sell it in a garage sale. You know, <laughs> so um, I think it was good that I was playing music that wasn't in the school curriculum and... Um, but I did learn a lot. I had good teachers in high school and college and junior high school. And I'm grateful that I had opportunities to have a jazz band in those towns. And I'm grateful that I had just enough to be able to start off as a professional in the field. I want to ask you, what's the process of writing a a song or a composition with the people in your band um, uh, today? Like not in high school, but your career as a musician? Yeah. So what happens is in my practice time, I spend time improvising and exploring ideas. 
and it could be on the saxophone, but often it's on some of the other instruments I've picked up. So the piano or the, for the last year or two, the guitar. And so I'll be on the instrument. And just like when I was a student, I'll hear an idea that's interesting. And then I'll try to string together other melodies to make it tell a complete story. And then once I've done that, I'll, I'll write it down on paper as just a, a melody and a set of chords. And then I'll, then I'll decide, okay, well, what kind of a group would this sound best with? Because mm -hmm. I might have a group that has just me and a guitar player. I might have another group that has organ, bass, and drums. Uh, and so, so I'll decide this would sound best with this kind of a group mm -hmm. and these people. And then when I accumulate enough songs in that category, then I'll, then I'll take them into that band and I'll say, okay, we're, let's do a show. Let's do, I have these five new tunes, um, but they're not all five new mm -hmm. tunes. They're, they're the ones that fit the band. And then we, we try them out and see which ones uh, work well. Great. And uh, the first time you were on any sort of stage, how did that feel like? To be honest, I had stage fright. <laughs> so when I was in when I was in high school or when I would play a solo, I would get nervous. I would shake a little bit. And then it wasn't until I played in a in an all star band in my geographic region where uh, I had 10 concerts one summer and they were at big outdoor venues and some of them had 10,000 people. Wow. <laughs> and um, it was just the repetition of doing it that summer until I stopped caring. I realized I needed to focus on what I was doing and other people were having their own experience. So yeah, just doing it, I guess, is just the best way to get over um, yes. that fright. And um, so what's your favorite part of being a musician? I would say that my favorite part is when all the practice that you put in, whether it's you and your group or you individually, comes to bear and um, and music starts playing you, you know, so it's basically uh, it's not you're not thinking about everything you're playing. You're not trying really hard. It's just happening. And that's the great thing when it's just, um, yeah, it's like the instrument plays you or mm -hmm. the band is playing you. And it's a great way of feeling connected. Great. And uh, when you said that you, the last few years, you were playing the guitar, um, did is that all like self-taught or do you take courses? Yeah, I was mostly self-taught on the piano. The guitar, I was fortunate to have a friend who had been a guitar teacher and was willing to show me some things. So we got together once a week on Zoom. He'd show me some things, then I'd mm -hmm. practice them. And so I, for the first time in years, I've had a real teacher and it's helpful to avoid learning bad habits. Sometimes you can get sore playing an instrument or get mm -hmm. tendonitis. Um, same thing with sports. It's good to have the right technique so that you don't hurt yourself and that you can yeah. really enjoy yourself. Yeah, because I do like running and piano and I just do it on my own. And sometimes like if there's not someone next to me to tell me you're not doing that right, it just becomes I think it's normal part. But then afterwards, I'm like, this doesn't sound right or I don't feel great um but it's hard to know which um part am, am, am i doing wrong so yeah that must be really helpful <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like uh it's good to have some instructions so that we don't learn bad habits because it's hard to change them once you mm -hmm. once it feels normal to do things a certain way it's hard to change it and yeah. do it the right way and so now let's talk a bit about um your consulting kind of part of your um, life. So what do you do specifically? Yeah, I work with companies, uh, software companies, and I help them to grow. So oftentimes they're very early stage and they have a tool that does things to help other companies. And, uh, and I help them to do their Google ads marketing, maybe their, their social media marketing, their uh, even did a podcast sponsorship mm -hmm. last month. Um, don't get any ideas just yet. Um, <laughs> and uh, and all kinds of uh, different channels where people can reach their customers. And I help them decide which channels to pick. I help them create their advertising and create a, a plan for them to grow. Um, what specifically led you into that field? Well, what led me into that field? I guess, you know, as a college student, I studied psychology. And I was very interested in what made people do things. Mm -hmm. You know, most of us feel that all of our decisions are made 
complete, you know, every behavior we have is completely rational mm -hmm. and it's completely thought through. And we don't realize that we are in, influenced by things like what famous people like to do or what advertisement we saw or, um, and so I, I just became interested in, in how people make those kinds of decisions. And then I like to write as well. So marketing became a, a natural direction. Okay. And uh, do you have any basic advice uh, you would like to share with our listeners about growing a business uh, or even like a software business more specifically? Well, <clears throat> I would say maybe I'll answer in two parts. And if for somebody who's going to grow a consulting business mm -hmm. or start their own business well, you, you know can, yeah you can yeah. do both um for that it's like i would say you know practice always talking to people and being interested in other people you know because in order to grow a business um uh you have to be very good at presenting ideas to people and understanding their needs and so even as a young person it's good to be instead of just talking to the people like me i'm going to talk to adults or i'm going to talk to um people interested in other things and become interested in them so yeah. I, I think that's helpful for somebody who's going to have their own business to be very social yeah. and, and, and outwardly interested um, for growing a company. Let me see. It's it can be pretty complicated, but a lot of it starts about uh, what is the space you're in? Who are the other people trying to meet the same need? And what are their strengths and weaknesses? What makes your product special? Mm -hmm. What makes it unique? And then what makes people interested? Where, where, do, where does your customer go to learn about this type of product? And so through all of those things, creating a, a, a mark, have a good marketing plan so that you know um, how to reach your audience with your product. Okay, so just making connections and planning, basically. Yeah. Thank you. And um, uh, what's one thing about doing this job that's a struggle for you? I would say it's the it's the process of going out doing what they call pitching, like so finding mm -hmm. finding new clients and new business. I love to help companies with their marketing. Mm -hmm. I love to do the writing, and I love to talk with them about their opportunities. Um, but to to meet new people and to get on the inside working with new companies, that piece is a little a little harder for me. So, um, and it is a part of the job of being a solo consultant is is pitching new business. Yeah, and I guess it's kind of, uh, like you said about being a musician, you just need to do it. And uh, I guess now you're more and more comfortable with the process. And it's also quicker. Um, mm -hmm. um, I like that you pointed that out, because even in this situation, I can learn. And it, the, I can make the connection between when I was a musician and I had stage fright. Yeah. And then doing the new thing that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's the same process. Maybe it's just a matter of repetition and practice. Yeah, definitely. Like podcasting the first time, my first episode, it was like so awkward. I, I, I First of all, I, I forgot to hit the record button. I was talking for half an hour. and uh, Good practice. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I had a meltdown because um, <laughs> I had my whole script. Um, then the more I do it, the, more, the quicker it gets. And even even more with like interviews, you know. Um, and now you also get to find kind of what you prefer doing. Like I really like interviews and um, also now I'm doing it more and more often. That means like I don't have to have a full script. I can just have some bullet points and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less worried and it also gets quicker. You know, I don't have to like um, say a hundred like tongue twisters before I start. <laughs> um yeah, and so do you, I just want, I was just curious, because do you spend a lot of time like on the computer um, when you're working in consulting? I do, a lot of time on the computer. And so I, I guess that must put um, a strain on your eye. So how do you like deal with, because um, I feel like it's it's very, um, with so many jobs, it's, it's often on the computer. So like, how do you deal with that? Like, do you go on a walks or do you just like take breaks? Or yeah. just you just don't mind and it doesn't affect you? Well, I have a thing that I use called the Pomodoro Technique. And mm -hmm. it's basically setting a timer, working for 25 minutes, and then taking a five-minute break. And mm -hmm. so in that five-minute break, I can stand up, stretch, get some water, um, or do whatever. I, and moving the body helps mm -hmm. to re-engage. And that also means hopefully it's five minutes with my eyes off the screen. Yeah, that's good. And... Um, Great. So now I wanted to ask you a few questions um, with someone else. 
So I want to bring your partner on because uh, for a while you guys lived in different countries and I thought it'd be interesting to ask you a few questions um, uh, because you guys are both so busy sometimes and how do you guys kind of keep that relationship strong? So my first question is for um, you, Ilana. So how is it living in a different country from your partner and how did you make it work in general? Well, it's um, definitely not the ideal situation. Um, you know, it can be a bit, uh, it can be a bit lonely, although of course you have friends and you meet other mm -hmm. people. Um, but what's, uh, what is uh, a bit difficult is that you're in a different place and you want to share experiences with a person. So there's a lot of like explaining, oh, I saw this amazing thing today, or I went to this amazing place and trying to convey that mm -hmm. to them. Um, so, you know, it's it's definitely a challenge, but I think there are ways to make it work for a limited amount of time. And I know many other people who have. I think ways to make it work is you have to, uh, first of all, have, uh, you know, some times that you set aside where you know that you're going to you're going to talk. And sometimes with time zones, it can be challenging. So really making sure that you're communicating with the person, setting times where you're going to speak and um and and making sure they're fairly frequent i think uh you know even just text messaging regularly mm -hmm. throughout the day those types of things are really helpful and then um and then you know finding things that you can even remotely do together so that was kind of my question for dave is um what did you guys do to connect even if you were far away like did you have any like once a week you would do this or you would do that yeah well fortunately we uh we had lived in the same city before so w one of the things that we had before was was date night and that means once in a, once a week we would have dinner together or we would just block the time and then mm -hmm. we would make a plan for for date night so we try we we continued date night even though we were three time zones and 2000 <laughs> miles apart uh 3000 kilometers apart so what we would do is um, for example, w one of the things we did is to have a streaming movie night where, where we would, where we would rent the same movie or stream the same movie from YouTube or whatever. Uh, we would sync up the start. So we started at the same time. Well, one of us would mute our, 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 our video and, and then we would hear the audio together through the phone so we could talk during the movie. Um, but mostly we could experience it at the same time. That's and then at, at the end, we could talk about how we felt about it. So instead of sitting alone and wishing your partner was there, it was a way of feeling together and and getting stimulated by something new and sharing, yeah. sharing an experience. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so with every episode of this season, I always ask two questions to um, finish off the episode. So first off, um, what advice would you give to a teen who wants to become a part-time or even full-time musician? I would say to to listen to music. You know, if if you're interested in music, then try to listen to everything you can and really listen, like like not just like like seven seconds on YouTube, but but really listen. What are all the instruments doing? How does it affect you? And then if that if you're interested in a song, well. Are there other songs from that same artist that interest you or in that style? And so listen and absorb a lot because everything that comes in your ears, you have a chance of putting out as sound. Um, the other thing, you know, I would say is practice um, mm -hmm. and even play games to make yourself practice. I was not someone who loved to practice, but pretty much the people who become professionals are people who put in a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. even if they've had to trick themselves to practice yeah. every day. <laughs> And um, last question, what advice would you give to teens in general? Well, I would say explore all of your interests. And when, when people ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Don't be afraid if it changes every year or two. Um, some people know early on, yeah. like Alana, who we just spoke with, you know, who's very interested in architecture. And some of us are middle aged and we still don't know what we want to be <laughs> when we grow up. So explore all the interests yeah. and... Um, and go after the things most interesting to you. Mine changes like every week. <laughs> so, That's awesome. um, okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on to the Everything Team podcast. And we hope to see you soon, maybe. 
and uh, have a nice day. Great. Thanks for having me. So that's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Email me at theeverythingteampodcast at gmail.com if you have any thoughts, comments, or business inquiries. Don't forget to leave that review on Spotify to support the pod and hit that subscribe button on YouTube to get notified for new episodes. And don't forget about the podcast's Instagram account at theeverything.teampodcast. And if you like what you heard, stay tuned for the next episode where I talk to another person about their career. See you soon. Mm -hmm.